So that means that people in Aberystwyth, which is just about as far from HS2 as you can get, um, are gaining, will literally gain from the construction of HS2. I get to basically do Hornby layouts, but at one-to-one -one scale, which yeah. is great. <laughs> There is no reason, no, no sensible reason, other than the limited resources of engineers there are in the country, um, to not be doing both of these things. It's the precursor to Hyperloop, and the reason it's stuck in a museum is because it's a dead end. Good morning, everybody. Oh. <laughs> you join us in York today, um, and we are talking about a, from your perspective, a controversial subject. Mm -hmm. We're talking about HS2. Um, we're meeting up with a, another special guest today called Gareth, Gareth Dennis, um, and we're going for a little bit of a trek across the, I think, the Derwent Valley Light Railway. Anyway, we'll get there very soon. But topic today, HS2, um, sustainable public transport. And here we are. Uh, welcome to the channel, Gareth. Hello, hello everyone. Um, so, where are we? Why have you brought us here, north of, that was north east of York? Yeah, north east. So I've brought you to this slightly funny corner of York. Um, we're just, uh, well, just behind us is the uh, Foss Islands Branch Railway, or the ex Foss Islands Branch Railway. Um, this is the line that connected the Dermot Valley Light Railway um, over to uh, the York to Scarborough line that still does exist. Right, so before we get onto any controversial subjects, a little bit more history about the line, Gary. Yeah, so um, so this uh, line was opened just before the First World War, actually, in about between 1912 and 1913. Okay. It connected up from the what is now the York Scarborough line uh, round to the Selby to Market Wheaton line, and so it was a bit of a, it was almost a bypass, um, and it's a bit of an oddity because this line and the Derwent Valley Light Railway uh, avoided being nationalised. So there's this weird pocket of private railway. Yeah. But during the First World War and during the Second World War, because it was a light railway, it was very uh, green. So all the green shoots growing up through the track which uh, is a nightmare for me as a track engineer. But anyway, um, it meant that it was very difficult to spot from the air. And so it got used uh, a lot. Okay. For, so they, they built some uh, military depots to store ammunition for, for the, um, for the yeah. various armed forces along the route. Um, and, and that meant that it actually carried a lot of traffic, yeah. um, military traffic during yeah. the wars, okay. which is good because shortly after opening, um, or rather after the First World War, it really struggled with passenger numbers. Uh, yeah. The reason being that all the roads started getting improved between York and Selby and in the whole area, and so right. everyone started taking the bus. Yeah. Uh, and so they really struggled. And okay. so they tried early, they had the early pacers, if you like, they had early yeah. bus, ve um, bus on uh, rail vehicles. Yeah, rail motors, the, the, I Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there was one by the Ford Motor Company, and there was one, that I can't remember the name, that had the most incredibly wonderful company name that yeah. made these buses. But they, they helped a little bit. Yeah. The reality was that people, this newfound freedom to drive, to kind of drive yeah. around on the road or it to get buses, they were really struggling. Yeah. So it's, a, it's an interesting little line. They've done a nice job in the, in the 90s, they converted it to a cycleway. So um, they put this big blue thing in. I've no idea what the blue thing is. Um, but anyway, <laughs> it's, so it's, very it's blue. quite nice. It's it is very blue. blue. <laughs> it's quite vividly blue. Yep. And there are lots of sculptures as we go along. Yep. Every now and then you can spot some railway things. So there's yeah. some, we're going to go and find some troughing route. The most exciting thing of this, of, of, of this railway is the fact there's loads of troughing route. The little yep. concrete sort of um, C-shaped uh, units that used to carry cables for the railway to operate. It works for me and it will work for a lot of our viewers too. <laughs> You're in good company. So Gaff, the main reason we wanted to come and speak to you is because we, I'm a big advocate of logic, let's say. So I try and teach our kids logical thinking. Mm. And whenever we look at your threads, your railways explained on Twitter, everything is logical and well thought out. Do you want to explain to us roughly what you do, um, I'd say living, spare time, whatever, whatever works for you, whatever, <laughs> yeah. um, and how that sort of in, interplays with your advocacy of HS2. Yeah, definitely. So <clears throat> my day job, it's a bit of a mouthful, I'm a senior permanent way design engineer, which basically okay. means I'm a, <clears throat> I'm a des railway design engineer, I design railways. I get to basically do Hornby layouts, but at one-to-one -one scale, which yeah. is great. <laughs> um, and so I, but I also do, so I do that engineering. I also do a bit of writing and teaching uh, right. and l pretty much every problem that there is in the rail industry, and there are plenty, uh, can run back to the fact that there isn't a strategy. There is no big plan. Yep. So that means that you don't have a nice rolling program of upgrades. You don't have rolling. You don't have the right skills to deliver stuff. Yep. And so there is only one glimpse of that that I've seen in all my time in the railways, and that's HS2. It's the only glimpse okay. of some forward thinking about yep. what the railways should deliver. 
Um, so, H so, so, that's, so my day job is, is alignment design, and so um, I've worked on HS2 briefly, so I'd, I've kind of worked on it for actually twice, two different elements of the project. I've worked on Crossrail, I've worked on lots of different projects. Yep. Um, permanent way engineers, we do the alignment. We also check that trains fit through spaces that, you know, the, the rail is nice and tight. So we've got to have trains fit past each other and through structures and so on. Yeah, so HS2, HS2 is really important. Um, the problem with our railways is they're kind of a jack of all trades and a master of none. So uh, you have railways that are doing, you've got stopping trains, yeah. you've got freight trains, you've got regional trains that kind of stop some places, but not all places. And then you've got the, the long distance high speed services that everything has to get out of the way for, yeah. and they just plummet through. And as a result of that, train you have to have lots of big gaps between trains to, so for example if you've got a train that stops in a station if the train behind it is a non-stop train yep. you've got to leave a huge gap in the timetable to allow the train that's behind it to keep going at full speed which means you're not making the most of our rail infrastructure no. what hs2 does is it takes those long distance services off the existing railway puts them onto a new line and allows all the other services to bunch up nice and closely together on the existing railway with allowing a massive leap in some places a tripling of capacity on the existing railway because they're going at slow speed because they're going because those are going manage. and it's, it's not necessarily so much about speed it's more about the pattern the stopping patterns and the yeah. way that the different service patterns interact if you simplify those service patterns all the trains can bunch up nice and closely together you look at Thameslink yeah. all those trains run at the same they stop at the same places yeah. they they run through at the same speeds which means that all the trains can bunch up really closely together Thameslink is a 40,000 yeah. passenger per hour in one direction railway and the clever thing about HS2's route and a lot of people moan about the route and the, the clever thing about HS2's route and its speed so two things route yeah. and speed is that it doesn't just do that for the west coast mainline it's achieving it for the midland mainline and for the east coast mainline yeah. so essentially you're getting three railways for the price of one because it's so fast and because of its route going through Birmingham which incidentally is exactly the strategic route that Stevenson plotted out okay. nearly 200 years ago <laughs> uh, google that um because of the route and the speed, it does it for all the three main lines. So rather, yep. the alternative would be that you'd have to do, if it was slower, you'd have to upgrade the West Coast main line and the middle main line and the East Coast main line, either by adding two tracks or by building short bypasses, which yep. would just be nightmarishly expensive. Three slightly slower railways are definitely more expensive than one slightly faster railway. Um, and all the expensive bits of HS2 are the, the slower bits anyway, where it's tunnelled and, and coming yes. into London anyway. The example I like to give is the Aberystwyth example. So my parents live in Aberystwyth, um, and people go, what? what are you on about? Aberystwyth is miles from HS2. What, what on earth are you talking about? Well, the trains that run to Aberystwyth run through Birmingham New Street, and they join the busy corridor from Wolverhampton through Birmingham New Street and down to Birmingham International. Mm -hmm. That corridor is absolutely saturated with mixed traffic. You've got the yeah. Virgin, well not Virgin, sorry, the Avanti West Coast trains that run through. Yeah. Um, you've got the regional trains that kind of stop a few places, and then you've got all the local ones that stop everywhere. And it's just a mess. It's hugely big. So if there's a slight delay uh, of the Aberystwyth train, as it's coming through, it'll just have to sit before it can join at Wolverhampton, just sit and do nothing, waiting for a slot. Okay. And so the reliability and the service frequency of that route is rubbish. Also, trying to find platforms at Birmingham U Street is a nightmare. Yep. HS2 will move all the long distance services, or almost all the long distance services, out into the new station at Curzon Street, freeing up platform space in New Street, which is great because that means you can have you've got more reliable platform spot, so you can have either a more frequent and certainly a more reliable service. Also, you are freeing up space on the Wolverhampton uh, to Birmingham International Corridor through New Street, which again improves the reliability of that service, meaning that you can have a, a once hourly or maybe even a more frequent Aberystwyth service that you cannot now because that, that route is chock-a-block. Yeah. So that means that people in Aberystwyth, which is just about as far from HS2 as you can get, um, are gaining, will literally gain from the construction of HS2. But the key thing to remember is that the main benefit, I talk a lot about modal shift. So the, the, the bigger picture is that um, greenhouse gas emissions from transport are climbing. They are now the, mm -hmm. the biggest source of greenhouse gas emissions in the UK is transport. It's nearly 30% of our, of our greenhouse gas, sorry, our carbon emissions. Yeah. Um, the only way we're going to fix that is by modal shift away from, or one of the major ways we've got to fix that. Yes, we can reduce transport, but actually road has about an 88% share of the way that we move people and things around in this country. Yeah. Um, and so if you, um, so, you can reduce journeys, great, but that's not going to solve that problem. You need to have you need to have modal shift. So you move people from road into rail. The only way to do that is to increase capacity because our railway is pretty full. Yep. So to do that, you need the capacity release that HS2 achieves. So HS2's main benefit is not actually on HS2. It's on the existing railways because yes. you can run more local, commuter, regional, and of course freight services yep. too. Okay, so we're nearly back to 
we're almost so we're almost sort of where the intersection at the end of the Foss Islands branch and where it meets the, the Derwent Valley Light Railway proper. Yeah. Um, yeah so we've, we've we've yeah I was gonna say the, yeah. the, the no the no contact we're on with, up and down this little bit of line. There's a few um, sculpturettes. Yeah, I think. and we I can't see any contacts. Gareth, can you see any uh, contacts? Well, so we're next to the Leerthorpe Gas Works, and so this is sort of I think it's representing a gasometer of some sort. And actually, you can see a real oh, disused gasometer. Yeah, so you can see a real disused oh, wow. gasometer behind. Uh, that's going to get ripped up and replaced with. Yeah. So yeah, so again, it gives an indication as to the. So we're getting close now. To, so this whole area, Foss Islands area in York, is post-industrial. Lots. Of, you look on that. You go onto the uh, the National Library of Scotland yeah. mapping website, and you just see this sprawl of yes. railway lines everywhere. Um, and so it's a good. So to, if you want to do that, you can see the scale yeah. of, of railway. So the gas works here was part fed into that. Yeah, and, and, um, yeah. A lot of talk recently. Rethink HS, rethink HS2 hashtag. Um, yeah, ancient forest. It's going to carve up. Countless... Yeah, it's going to. It's what was it? What's the what's the quote? Which is which is false. Uh, one hundred percent false. Which is um, over one hundred uh, ancient woodlands to be destroyed by HS2. Right. It's just not true. So. Um, and I did a thread about this that people are welcome to, to go and find. But essentially, um, the scale of, firstly, the scale of HS2's uh, impact on things like ancient woodland. Yeah. Um, we obviously have to minimise impact of new infrastructure like HS2. But if you consider that for a 470 mile long railway, it's impacting on, and it, this is impacting on, not destroying, this is just, so that includes yeah. vibration, noise, noise dust, yeah. without any damage being done to the forestry itself. Um, uh, 470 miles of railway and it's damaging around about 50 hectares okay. so that's about 0.1 hectares per mile um, if you go to the lower Thames crossing which is a new motorway being built down at the uh, other end of London yeah. motorway 14 miles long and it is also uh, impacting on over 50 hectares right. and that's so that's 40 miles so that means that it's damaging uh, it's impacting on 3.7 hectares per mile yeah. so that's 37 times more damaging than hs2 yeah. and that's for a motorway and the alternative to h and the, the key thing with environmental impact yes there are localized issues but the railway has been designed to minimize those very much it's not a case of we just bulldoze through 10 years of design iteration to make sure that yeah. you weave your way through all of this site to site special scientific interest all the yeah. um special areas of conservation these are proper uh, biodiverse uh, kind of habitat yeah. designations yeah. diving through those um the, the amount of tunnel for example through the chilterns the length of tunnel has been increased which will increase the carbon cost of the construction but it's to minimize habitat loss yeah. and that can be offset carbon costs of construction a lot of people talk about that as well environmentally oh yeah. it's, it's going to be it's going to take 120 years before it's carbon neutral that again is uh, not correct no. so the, the cost of construction of hs2 from a carbon perspective is equivalent to about a month of carbon emissions from road transport wow. so if you can imagine if you can reduce carbon emissions by over the whole you know within 10 years of hs2 opening if you can reduce carbon emissions by even 10 percent uh per year yeah then you're then you have paid car, HS2 yeah. has paid for itself carbon yeah. wise so the idea that it's not carbon neutral for 120 years is based on a very narrow view of looking at just the modal shift that happens just on HS2 but yeah. as we talked about HS2 is about is, is mostly about the existing railway not yeah. about HS2 woodlands the very important part of woodland uh, biodiversity is actually the soil so the, the kind of 10 inches of soil uh, below ground level they're actually picking it up transplanting it and, and making sure that wow. they when they grow the forest adjacent to the bit where they've maybe gone through yeah. they'll grow it using the soil that they've lifted so they retain yeah. the, the the kind of the invertebrate life the bacteriological yeah. kind of growth within the hummus the, so the soil at the top so they're actually growing they're not just planting a load of naive trees next to it they are doing that work to ensure that the habitat is maintained retained as best as it can be seven million new trees are being planted they're frustrating things like cycleways being chopped out of the scope that unfortunately is because um, our government knows the um, cost of everything and the value of nothing we need to campaign that so green campaigners should be campaigning for those to be kept in HS2 rather than campaigning to, to bin HS2. Um, the bigger picture is that we will not have a planet to live on if we do not reduce our carbon emissions. HS2 yeah. is a fundamental part of that and it has to be part of a wider policy. Um, it can't just sit in isolation. There has to be big, a bigger policy implication of reducing car usage. Um, improving habitat growth, planting lots more new trees nationally, not just because of HS2. Yeah. It's got to be part of a bigger picture, because if it isn't, we're all going to have to learn to swim and grow gills. Yeah. 
next part of uh, today's adventure, Gaff, where have you brought us now? So I brought us to a uh, nearby Stamford Bridge, just out to the east of York, and we are now on the York to Market Wheaton line, actually the York to Beverly line, which was, um, so the bit we're on now was built um, in the late 1840s, um, connecting York, basically York through to Hull, actually. I thought this is a good line for us to come and walk along because, for me, it's one of the railways that really ought to still be running as a railway. The road, uh, the road between York and Hull, that route is a very busy commuter line, uh, yeah. commuter ro route. Yes. Huge amounts of traffic. Um, it's absolutely barking mad that the railway doesn't exist. Yeah. Um, I can cycle to Beverly quicker than it takes me to get the train <laughs> there, which shouldn't just, just should not be a thing. So, in terms of the biggest question, we're probably asked is why not reuse the Grand Central or perhaps involved with that is why not use um, East Coast Main Line or West yeah, Coast, why, why not expand those, that's yeah. that, that sort of theme. Yeah, so so um, let's go with widening existing lines first. So we touched a little bit about, about that on the environmental uh, issues, so the woodland issues yes. of the HS2. If you follow any of the existing main lines, you'll see that not only are they flanked by or part kind of clumped through um, large areas of woodland, yep. um, well-established woodland, yes. but also lots of houses back onto the existing railway lines. Now, to do what HS2 does, you would need to add two extra lines onto the West Coast main line, the East Coast main line, and the Midland main line. That's three major main lines that have 150 so, years of properties built up onto the back of them that would, you'd have to blitz yeah. to add those two extra lines. And so when the, you say to do what it has to do, you mean relieving uh, the existing railway to allow you to get to, to get pull those long distance services off onto their own line and allow everything else to bunch up nice and closely together yeah. to bump capacity up on the on those lines. So yeah. uh, places like, uh, for example, Retford on the East Coast Main Line at the moment has a pretty poxy service. Yeah. By getting rid of the long distance trains that just fly through there without stopping, all of a sudden you can increase the service frequency to maybe a train every 15 minutes yeah. so that's the existing area but in terms of the Great Central I hear it a yeah. lot people say oh I'll just reopen the Great Central um, because it was a high speed line firstly the Great Central was not a high speed line okay um, it was built to achieve the fast speeds of the day which was in the 1890s about 90 miles an hour and um, the alignment if you built rebuilt on that route to kind of high speed uh, kind of um, mainline standards you could just about push 125 miles an hour of it with tilt so without tilt, tilt is sort of, we're moving past tilt now, tilt is heavy and uh, expensive to maintain and not the best way to, to run a rail, it's a compromise just like bi-mode trains are a compromise. Yeah. Um, if you just had conventional trains running on that, you'd struggle to get more than 110, 115 miles an hour out of those yeah. alignments. But Number two, it doesn't go to Birmingham, so, that's, so you have to build a new bit anyway. So by the time you've done that, it's kind of in the wrong place, you're increasing yeah. length. Third point, You'd have to, so the, the line going the wrong place, it's weavier, so on and so forth, it's not going to relieve all three main lines. You're only going right. to build it basically as a relief line for the middle main line if you did the Great Central, right. which is useless because you're not, mm. you're not re re relieving Birmingham New Street Station, mm -hmm. you're not relieving, you're, you, you're having to build a new line up to Manchester and Leeds anyway, yeah. so, so it's not, not, sol any bottlenecks whatsoever. It's not like, solving any yeah. problems. Yeah. Don't get me wrong, it'd be wonderful to reopen the Great Central Railway. I, I, my, every time I look at pictures of them ripping up through Leicester and through not like, oh, it's awful to see. It was yeah. one of the great acts of in infrastructure vandalism of the 20th century. Um, but that doesn't mean that it solves our problems to reopen no, it. No, it, well, it, we're, we're talking 60 years on, different problems, different networks, yeah, different yeah. you know, different lives of people. It's a different, the, the way that the country functions is very different. Yeah. Um, I, the reason I know a little bit about the Great Central Railway, not just because I'm a big old railway nerd, but also because the last person to do any alignment design on the Great Central Railway was me because the um, the new bridge that's just gone over the Great Cent uh, the over the Midland Main Line for the Great Central at Loughborough is my alignment. Um, which I'm very proud of. So, so I, I did my master's thesis on heritage railways, um, and uh, <laughs> and strangely enough, the first job I almost the first job I worked on ended up being a heritage railway connecting right. the Great Central North and yeah. the Great Central Railway, the lovely double track Great Central Railway that runs from Loughborough Central down towards uh, not uh, down towards Leicester. So, um, fantastic. Yeah. I d we did tell you you're in good company today. Uh, it's a claim you hear a lot. Uh, no, it, 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 well, for starters, um, the Channel Tunnel cost over twice as much uh, yeah. per mile, so about £570 million pounds per mile. Uh, Crossrail is costing about £280 million pounds per mile. Actually, it'll be more than that by the time the, the latest cost increases. Of, yeah. Yeah. So you're looking at probably about £300 pounds per mile. Uh, HS2 is only about £200 pounds per mile. Um, people quote the 
million pounds mm. per mile uh, thing at me, which is not, it's 200 million pounds per mile ish HS2. Yeah. Um, and obviously, that's it, what we're doing there is also normalizing across the whole route because that includes huge brand new stations at Curzon Street, um, massive expansions of Euston, uh, Manchester, uh, uh, Piccadilly, and, and Leeds uh, Central Station as well. H huge kind of expansion. So in Europe, for example, they generally pull these things out into smaller sections. So they do a station yeah. a project at its own, and then so when you hear costs being quoted for things like the the, the French LGVs, yeah. um, they're always much lower than we, we uh, the costs we quote here. But that's because they generally cut out the really expensive stuff into their own projects. A good example of this, uh, the most expensive bit of road we've built, um, I think, in the UK is the M74 extension through Glasgow, okay. which uh, cost around about 300 million per mile, which is, yeah, about 50% again more expensive than HS2. Is. Per mile. Yeah, yeah, so that's wow. a huge cost. Yes. Um, the Heads of the Valley route is about 60 million, so corrected for inflation is about 60 million per mile, right. which is again inordinately expensive. Mm. You consider that. Um, if you consider that the uh, cost of the Selby diversion when it was built, um, uh, so that was the, the diversion of the East Coast Main Line to avoid a coal field, yeah. that was built in the, in the early 1980s, correct for inflation, that cost about £50 million pounds per mile. Right. Um, if you look at, so yeah, uh, H HS1 costs around about £150 million pounds per mile, around about that, roughly ballpark figures, to give you an idea yeah, of scale. Yeah, yeah. So whenever you're looking at costs of, of, of new infrastructure, you have to correct for inflation. You have to think about, okay, that was built then. You've got to be, make sure you're comparing like for like. Yeah. So um, until, the recent, uh, until the recent sort of cost increase uh, announcements about HS2, actually HS2 and HS1 cost about the same per mile. If you think HS1 didn't involve a huge brand new railway station being built, uh, it didn't involve a St Pancras. The work at St Pancras was fairly substantial, but it was not a total rebuild of the station. It was, yeah. uh, whereas HS2 involves Curzon Street, brand new station, massive yeah. three major remodeling, and then the new uh, hub between uh, Derby and Nottingham that will be built, the East yeah. Midlands hub. Huge amount of new work. So well, actually, relatively speaking, impressed. relatively speaking, if you think about how you're getting a lot for your <clears> for your yeah. a lot of bang for your buck as it yeah. were. reality is that capital infrastructure like that is not spent out of the daily bu uh, budget of the country you borrow that money you borrow the kind of the amount you spend every year against future economic growth yeah. so the reality is you can borrow mu it, it shouldn't so when it comes to things like reopening lines like the um, York to Hull the York to Beverly line behind us here um, it's not a case of either or we should be doing both there is no reason no no sensible reason other than the limited resources of engineers there are in the country um to not be doing both of these things but you cannot reopen lots of new um railway lines like the york to beverly line because the capacity on the existing network is already constrained so you don't have any space in the major stations like leeds manchester birmingham yeah, another, to actually another bring that another in. line coming yeah. in you don't have the space to platform those extra services until hs2 comes along and it frees up all that space yeah. We're now in everybody's favourite place. I say everybody's favourite place because it's, I, I speak for Gareth, I speak for Rebecca, I speak for myself. And probably not for the last time today, you're going to see one of these. Um, so why do you love this place, Gareth? Stupid question, I'm sure. I mean, it's just, it's just a joyous collection of wonderfully beautiful things. And actually, although we're surrounded by these incredible locomotives and items of rolling stock, my favourite room is actually somewhere else. Okay, shall we go? Let's go. We're in the we're in, we're in the warehouse, which is no, which is also known as the North Shed, um, and it's my favorite, absolute favorite bit of the museum because there's just stuff, absolutely everywhere. There is a lot of. I mean, lot where of... do you start? There's yeah. just so much. Come, come this way. Uh, we've just been talking about it. We've been talking about new railway lines, and I thought I'd come and show you. We talked about oh, why do things always take so long? And two snippets of these two models are some of my favorites. So this. And also the one that's just over here that some people are enjoying over here are models of the original Channel Tunnel Rail Link. So this is not the one that became H. This is what eventually became HS1. But actually, before that, you can see here some nice Thunderbirds font. I don't know if you can see that in shot. But this is where the. So this is a, just a short section of showing what the connection to the, the Channel Tunnel would have looked like back when it was going to be built in the 1970s. Nice to meet you. Hi, 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 nice to meet you. Hi,
from EU. Hello, look. I, I assume you're having an okay time, you know, as days go. It's all right. All right. It's fair to say we're having a, a good trip. No, it genuinely, it, it's been a, a, a lovely, lovely three days. We've just seen so many lovely things, yeah. so many people. And, and every, every oh, we've, we've gone to Edinburgh, Edinburgh twice. It does feel like I've seen all of Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you went the long way round, didn't you? Yeah, in rest, you went past miles. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's so yeah. Stirling, got Perth, Tavebridge, Forthbridge. Um, I mean, the Cayenne Boards. I mean, yesterday, going up over to Rockstar Park. Yeah. Uh, in a in a Mark Three carriage, yeah. like, frothing now. <laughs> um, <laughs> there were people again, just going along and seeing people putting their cars over to the side yeah. and waiting for it. The thing that I really enjoy is what's actually abroad. Because abroad, there's an atmosphere of genuine, a genuine joy and delight. Oh, and you've got people who are, who are dressed up like, like you know, I've got my little badge from 1970s. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. absolutely. Um, the driver this morning who came in his original VR yes, Starship. Uh, yes, yes. Um, but again, on the inside, we've got, we've got all these wonderful posters. We've got Travellers yeah. Fair posters. Yeah. And NNER have done this in their own time. Many, yeah. of, many of the staff yeah. have also. Most of the staff you see on the train today are volunteering. They are. Charity. Because it's a charity that yes. is raising money for Calm and for Samaritans. And for Samaritans. And for local charities too. So yes. Do go online if you want to listen, have a cut this bit. Do go online, look up the Calm Zone and donate to the Calm Zone or Samaritans, please. Google LNER Calm Zone, donate some money. It's a, it's a lovely charity and the staff are giving all their time towards us. Okay, so as the, um, as the HST um, leaves its, it, one of its farewell final tours from York, um, we want to say a big thank you to uh, Gareth for joining us today and explain a lot about HS2. Um, we will see Gareth again, I'm sure, very soon. Yeah, I actually hope so. I think it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Hopefully I've answered quite a few of your questions. Um, and, yeah. uh, and I look forward to the video going out. Cheerio.